This might be the end of points. If you have a Capital One card, there's a pretty good targeted offer, and the Ultimate Cashback card might be coming soon, but there is a catch. This and more in today's roundup. Big favor, give this a thumbs up to help with the algorithm. If you know someone that might benefit, then share this with them. One of the big stories in the past few days is that the Department of Transportation is investigating airline rewards programs. They're looking at the big four airlines, so American, Delta, Southwest, and United. A pretty aggressive letter was sent to all the airlines, and there were a lot of questions that they want answers to. There technically are 12 questions, and it's quite a bit. Airlines have to provide information by December 4th, 2024. There's a lot of questions, but you can bring them down to about six pillars. The first one is the program details and the structure. Pretty standard for the most part, the interesting one being how the points are valued. I'm pretty sure most of us are curious about that as well, so we know the top line, but what's the average? The second pillar is historic changes and impact in the last six years. More importantly, how they decided to make these changes. This one might get juicy for United because they are pretty well known at this point for devaluations without any method. We'll get into that though. Number three is financial and operational data, a lot of it being around redemptions. So how do airlines themselves value the miles and what's the cost? And to be fair, they are businesses. I'm expecting them to make money, but I'm curious about the margins. Four, five, and six are a lot less interesting. So how M&A has played a role, customer complaints and how they react to competition, and also legal agreements and how accounting works. The core question though, being how airlines make these decisions and whether they're fair. On one hand, it makes a lot of sense. We're spending time and oftentimes even money to earn these miles and airlines can devalue them at any point. On the other hand, it might cause them to simplify the model and not in a good way. Let's actually go through each of my airlines and who I think is the biggest culprit. For the most part, I think it's United and you can make an argument for maybe American, but for their metal. The interesting thing is that you can even see this acknowledged within the points community. For example, in June, 2017, United miles were valued at 1.5 cents per point. In 2018, it dropped down to 1.4. Fast forward six years to 2024, it's down to 1.35. As someone that views points and miles as a way to unlock interesting experiences, United hasn't really fared well. In the last two years, we've seen a lot of saver availability pretty much dry up and vanish. You do get better inventory if you have United cards, but a lot of people that aren't in the space don't know that. Beyond that, inventory can vary by elite status, so if you don't like to do research, then this can feel like a black box. In addition, prices have also just gone up. For example, if you want to fly to the US, to Asia, then you're paying 100k points for business class. For US to Europe, it's going to be 80k points in business. And if you want to fly first class of partners like Lufthansa to Europe, then you're looking at 140k points. Most people view United removing award charts back in 2019 as an end of an era. It also kind of meant that they could do anything and didn't have to justify it. And that's pretty much exactly what they've done. They've been on a warpath and destructive course to destroy points and save money. In contrast, everyone else, even American, has been a lot more passive here. For example, it sounds like American is not looking to devalue their miles, and given everything going on, I don't think they will. The really good part is that they do have an award chart for partners. So for example, if you want to fly from Konis to Asia, it's 60K miles for business and 80K for first. 80K American miles to fly their partner Japan Airlines in first class is pretty solid. More than reasonable in my book and a great way to unlock an experience. You can argue availability and that's fair, but at least there's a set price. I don't know, something about market price always annoys me. I get it, but it feels too much like a black box. Ironically, that's kind of why it's interesting and funny that Southwest and Delta were dragged into this. Southwest has a pretty simple program, pretty much peg to cash and it's set or forget. Good in a sense because you know exactly what you're getting, but not great if you're looking for upside. Let's actually look at some prices going from LAX to SFO. So when it's $49, it's 2,600 points and 74 is 4,500. Doing the math there, you can calculate cents per point and you can see that on the business select, it's about 1.4 and the one to get away, the economy fair, it's upwards of even 1.8. You get more value for economy. In most cases, people value it at 1.4 because that's kind of the floor for economy. The more expensive the retail price, the more points you need. It's not pegged to an award chart or distance or anything else. Let's do one more out of curiosity and here is LAX to Hobby Houston. More expensive retail, the more points you need. This one is a bit worse, down to 1.35 cents per point for business select, but one to get away is still around 1.4. And that's actually pretty consistent across all three flights. And that's why people are happy to value Southwest at 1.4, because that's what you're getting. As much as people hate Delta, they're pretty similar. So first off, it's hard to devalue a program that people have been making fun of since 2010, almost 15 years. 
The main reason for this is because Delta miles are not great for premium fares like they are for other airlines. So much so that it was the butt of the joke in the points world for a very long time. The funny thing though is that it's not actually bad bad. It's more so that you don't get upside. But it's pretty much like Southwest. But yeah, I think the fact that a lot of people here are focused on luxury travel and aspirational travel, it makes it so that you don't really want Delta miles and you don't really get as much value. Or technically, I guess you do get value, but not outsized value, so it doesn't break the system. For example, if you have a Delta card, you can use 5,000 miles to cover $50 of your flight, 10K for 100, and so on. That pretty much means that you're locking in one cent per point as a minimum, and that's a known value. For example, if you have 1.6 million miles, that's at least $16,000 in flights on Delta. That's great for economy and if you want to know what you're getting, but if you're looking for business class, that might only be four flights. In contrast, if those 1.6 million miles were Alaska or American miles, then that might be at least 16 first class flights. Back to Delta, let's say you want to fly from San Francisco to Tokyo, you're looking at 374,000 miles for Delta One suites. That's a lot of points, and the main reason is because it's pegged to the retail price. So they want a lot of miles because they're otherwise charging a lot of money for the flight. One interesting thing about Delta though is if you're flying from let's say London to Tokyo, then it's a lot less. In this case, it's 80,000 points and a lot more fees, but still a pretty good deal. But yeah, normally if you're flying into or out of the US, you're paying a lot more points and it's not that great. The one exception to this is Delta flash sales, which do tend to be pretty good, but it's also a bit of a question mark and not the most reliable. So for example, last week you could book Delta One to Japan for 90,000 miles and pretty much anywhere in Europe for 98,000 miles. It is from the US, but you have to wait for the flash sales and it's a lot less reliable. Okay, so what are my thoughts on this whole Department of Transportation thing? I'm guessing it's mostly posturing, but we'll see. Best case, United stops the devaluation streak, or at least gives us some method to the madness. Even if it's a schedule, that's fine. So for example, if they're telling us that every year they end up increasing prices by 5%, not ideal, but at least we know what's going on. When you can work around it, that feels more fair, and that's the best case. The worst case is that it gets overregulated to the point that they just simplify it, but way too much. I think people that like aspirational travel and finding availability would hate for programs like American to become like Southwest or Delta. It's good to know what you're getting, but when there's no upside, it's a lot less fun. Whenever there's complexity, it favors people that want to do the homework and learn the system. Also, to be fair, there are a lot of tools out there now that help simplify everything and make it super easy. But yeah, more than happy to use tools to find flights and save money based off the retail price and what I'd happily pay. If anything does happen, it's going to be pretty far down the line. So in the meantime, I think it makes sense to keep getting miles and points. On that note, if you want to learn about cards, we have links on the website, asksabby.com, and also down below in the description box. Make sure the links are competitive, that they make sense for you, but otherwise, it is a huge way to support the channel. So thank you in advance. Moving to a lightning round and on the note of Capital One, check your emails because there's a pretty good offer. The title is going to be Venture X Access to Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour. You have the potential opportunity to buy tickets for retail price for Miami, New Orleans, and Indianapolis. You're not guaranteed the right to buy tickets. It's a raffle, but still probably worth entering. It's up to two tickets and you select your preference. It is targeted and it's not for everyone. You had to have the Venture X before August 31st. You also need to be on Capital One's email marketing offers, so don't unsubscribe. I'm not really a Swifty, but Mandy is and she's excited, so we'll see what happens. If you're looking for something a bit more tangible, Moomoo is offering new members up to 15 free stocks. You get five for depositing 100 and an extra 10 for depositing a total of 1,000, and the current offer ends November 30th. Be careful because there are some terms and you do need to keep money in there for a little bit, but not too long. For both, it is 60 days to unlock the stocks, which doesn't feel that unreasonable. I think the idea is that you have time to test other features, so no commission trading and a bunch of technical analysis tools. Note that Moomoo is a member of SIPC and they are a registered brokerage that's regulated by FINRA. Link down below if you want to check it out and get up to 15 free stocks. For the last story, we're looking at a potential end game option. Things can change, but it's sounding pretty good for Team Cash Back. Pretty much a Thanos level threat in a lot of ways. US Bank is looking to launch the Smartly card where you get up to 4% on all your purchases with no limit. So that sounds pretty good and it's apparently not a pipe dream. It's going to be no annual fee and it's supposed to launch late 2024. In fact, the landing page for this is already up on the US Bank site. There is a catch though and it's how much money you have with them. Number one, you need to have a US Bank Smartly Savings account 
and qualifying balances that can be in your deposit, trust, and investment accounts. In order to earn a total of 2.5% on all your purchases, you need to have between $5,000 and about $50,000. For 3%, it's $50,000 to $100,000, and 4%, it's north of $100K. The good thing though is that it's not idle money, you can earn interest. As of filming, even if you left it in the Smartly Savings account, that's still 4.1% APY, which isn't bad. Technically, there is an opportunity cost. For example, for Moomoo, Moo, you have 5.1% as a base APY for the cash sweep. So you need to spend enough money to justify the difference in the interest. For Team Cash Back, since you're kind of fighting on the margin, small differences can add up. Let's say you have the minimum of 100K at 5.1% APY, that's 5,100, and at 4.1, 4,100. So pretty much a $1,000 difference in the interest that you're making. Technically, there is a tax component there as well, but let's just keep it simple here. That pretty much is your annual fee. So even though the card has no annual fee, there's an opportunity cost that plays that role. In order to break even to make up that difference, you would need to spend $25,000 on your everything else category. If you spend that much or more per year, then you're good to go. If you spend less, then a bit iffy. Also, even if you don't want to use Moomoo, Moo, there are a lot of other options that give between 4.25 to 5.25 from some pretty big names. I'll put links down to some below in case you're curious. If anything, I think investments might be the better move, but even then there are still some fees. For example, you're paying $4.95 per trade, and there also is a $50 yearly fee if your brokerage balance is below 250 k I think normally we don't consider 50 bucks that big of a deal, but in order to earn that back, you are spending $1,250 at 4%. Obviously depends on you, but I think if you have 250 k and up in your investments, it probably makes sense. If you spend north of 25 k on your everything else category, also probably works. And if your money is otherwise idle and earning below 4.1% or even at 4.1%, then this is logical. The target here though is very much team cash back and also people that are currently with Bank of America. The reason for this is because B of A has a similar model where they have gold, platinum, platinum honors, and diamond tiers where you earn more points for your credit card. 25, 50, 75, and 75% respectively, depending on the level. For example, with 100K, you get 75% more rewards, and this can also be in their brokerage. Best case, it forces Bank of America to up their program, and an arms race where we benefit never hurts. Competition is good for us as consumers. For me personally, I'm probably sticking on team travel because I like that more, and I currently get more value based off what I'm trying to do. And to be fair, a lot of it is based off what my player two wants to do and what we're having fun with. Also feel free to check out those channels for some trip inspiration. And Sebi Fung is almost at 10K, so check it out and consider subscribing. But for Team Cashback, I think this is a great development. And even with the requirements, I think it's a net good thing. My hope is that it flies free and it doesn't end up getting its wings clipped. Or even worse, end up like a penguin that doesn't really fly. Again, if you want to learn about cards, we have links on the website, asksabi.com, and also down below in the description box. If you made it to this point, leave a penguin emoji in the comments down below and I'll try to heart it and also respond. Three questions, what are your thoughts on the dot situation and what outcomes are you expecting? Number two, are you on team cash back or team travel? Number three, do you think 4% back on everything is sustainable? Let me know and everyone else know in the comments down below. Big favor, thumbs up, share this with a friend, but otherwise hope you liked it. See you next time.